Thanks, Cara. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to be talking to you today about a fully integrated 3.5 GHz Doherty MMIC. This is where we're going to end up. This is um, in a custom uh, laminar package on the evaluation PCB. But before we get there, I'm going to give you an introduction to the theory behind the Doherty amplifier for those who might not be so familiar with it. I'm going to talk about the design and the simulation of the MMIC and then show some measured results, uh, S parameters, pulse of large signal measurements, and then we also measured with a representative 5G new radio signal. I'll finish off with some conclusions. So the point of the Doherty amplifier is to improve backup efficiency. That's really its key reason for, for being. And this is really important for communications applications, where we'll have modulated signals, which have high peak to average ratios. We're not going to be operating uh, full output power um, all the time. In fact, most of the time we won't be. We'll be operating somewhere at uh, back off. And I've shown here in red the class B um, sort of efficiencies. And you can see that at the zero dB back off power level, we get theoretical efficiencies of 78.5%. But when we're backed off at maybe 10 dB, 6 dB, our efficiencies are much, much lower than that. The Doherty, in <coughs> comparison, has a secondary uh, efficiency peak. Uh, in this case, it's at 6 dB, where the efficiency is also 78.5%. And the way this works is we have a main amplifier, which is conducting all the time. That's doing most of the work. That's conducting uh, a small signal. And at large signal, the auxiliary amplifier is kicking in, and that's amplifying the peaks, which are coming along relatively infrequently. And we can look at the uh, operation of the dirty amplifier by considering the load lines. So I've shown in blue here, this is a typical class B load line. And we can see that we're exercising the device across its full range of the 28 volt bias. We're swinging. Uh, across the full range of current and of voltage. However, when we're at lower powers, we're not going to be swinging along the whole load line. We're going to be somewhere around here, for example. Okay. Uh, so if we were at half an uh, amp here, we wouldn't be seeing the full range, uh, full voltage swing. What we'd like to do for our efficiency is to be on the black load line that I've shown here, okay? where we've got double the voltage so double the resistance, which is leading to double the voltage, and that's restoring our efficiency. But we can't have this black load line at high power, because when we then try to drive the device harder, we'll end up in the knee region. What we'd ideally like is a load line that's <coughs> at low power, it's like this black load line, but at high power, it transforms into this blue load line here. Okay. And that's what the Doherty amplifier does. <coughs> So at low power, the auxiliary amplifier is switched off. Okay, now the, the way this is done is it's actually biased in class C, so that the uh, input power is not sufficient to, to turn the, the FET on. We have a matching network taking us from 50 ohms to R opt over 2. That impedance is then transformed through an impedance inverter into 2 R opt, and that's what the main amplifier uh, is seeing. So that's the black load line that I've shown on this slide. When we're in high power mode, the auxiliary amplifier is switched on. And the impedance the main amplifier is now seeing is R opt. And that happens because we still see our R opt over two point here, but there's current coming from the auxiliary amplifier, which is load pulling the main <coughs> amplifier. So this point here, this combination point, is an impedance of R opt. The transformation is no longer taking place in the impedance inverter because it's got the same characteristic impedance, R opt. So the main amplifier is now seeing the blue load line here, which is uh, full efficiency at um, zero dB back off. The auxiliary amplifier is also seeing R opt, so that's operating in an efficient mode as well. So there are several advantages to the Doherty amplifier. The main one is efficiency at back off. It's also a self-managing topology. And what I mean by that is it's still got one RF input, one RF output, and some DC supplies. There's no uh, DSP required to control it. When we talk of the auxiliary amplifier switching on, 
that happens naturally with uh, input power uh, increasing if you set the biases correctly. So it's simple to integrate into your transmitter. It's also an adaptable and versatile topology, and I'll show you on the next slide some of the different implementations of this. And it gives linear behavior, and it's compatible with digital pre-distortion, which is very important for the communications uh, application. It does have a couple of disadvantages. One is that you get lower small signal gain compared to an equivalent balance design. <coughs> So if we think about the low power mode, we can see that we've got input power going into main, which is being amplified, but the auxiliary is not doing any amplification. Okay? There's power that's going in, and it's just being dissipated into the auxiliary. So your gain isn't as high compared to if this auxiliary amplifier was, was biased on. Another disadvantage is you need careful design to optimize the efficiency and linearity. We can see that compared to a conventional class AB or class B amplifier, we've got to design the main amplifier, but we also have to design the auxiliary <coughs> amplifier. This matching network here has to take us from 50 ohms to R October 2, and if we get that wrong, then the impedance inversion uh, and the impedance we present to the main amplifier is going to be incorrect as well. We have to design our impedance inverter properly, get the phase optimized here, and make sure that the phase on the input splitter uh, is equal so that we get a combination of signals with the main and the auxiliary to be correct. So there's a lot of, lot of potential things to get wrong with this design. So, but with careful design, you can get some excellent performance. <clears throat> so Dirty's been implemented in a number of different form factors and size ratios. Uh, PCB with discrete devices, MMICs and quasi-MMICs. There's a choice of size ratio between the main and the auxiliary amplifier, which sets where your back-off efficiency peak occurs. The Doherty amplifier has been implemented in gallium arsenide, gallium nitride, and LDMOS. It was originally a vacuum tube technique from the 1930s, of course, as well. And it's been implemented at range of powers and frequencies. So from hundreds of watts down at 900 megahertz or uh, 2 gigahertz up to half a watt at 30 gigahertz. And there's lots more literature out there. So it's a very versatile uh, configuration. We chose to design an MMIC on gallium nitride uh, using a symmetrical design. And we targeted uh, a power of 45 dBA. Quick word about the gallium nitride process that we used. This was from GCS, who are a pure play compound semiconductor wafer fab. They've got uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.4, and quarter micron gallium silicon carbide technology. These processes are qualified and are in production. And there's a six inch line ready for production and capacity is due to double in this year. If you want more information about that, I've included a link to our website, to, to the GCS website, sorry. I'm going to take you through the design of our IT now. We can see this is our main amplifier here and our auxiliary amplifier. It's a symmetrical design, so they're the same size. And the reason for that is it allowed us to do our design quicker because we've got symmetry here so we can just design one amplifier and mirror it, which means we can do our design a lot quicker. In Crypto's book about Doherty's, this is known as the Doherty light configuration, where you don't get quite as good back off efficiency as a, an asymmetrical design, but you can realize most of the benefits and it's a much easier to design. We've got our input splitter here, and we chose a lumped element designed to save space on our MMIC. You can see that it's a two stage design and you have to pay a lot of attention to getting the size ratio between your driver and your output device correct. If you get your driver amplifier too small, then it won't be able to drive the MIC uh, hard enough and your output power and gain will suffer. However, if you make it too large, your PAE will suffer because it's dissipating more power than is required. You can see here, this is our impedance inversing network here. 
So this is the 90 degree line, and this is our R up over 2 point here, and this is matching that we're taking from R up over 2 into the Jones. We also have uh, DC blocks on the input and output, so it's a fully integrated design, which minimizes the number of off-chip components. And similarly, we have uh, decoupling capacitors uh, in all the available space, again, to minimize the amount of decoupling that's needed off-chip. So some small signal simulations now. You can see uh, we've designed this across the 3.4 to 3.8 gigahertz band, and we're getting good input and output return losses, which are these two here. We're getting a, a nice flat small signal gain here of around about 19 dB in simulation. And with all of our designs, we tried to design in some uh, excess sort of guard bands so that if there are any uh, inaccuracies in the PDK or in our EM simulations, um, or just natural process variation, the performance can shift a little bit in frequency, but it'll still end up uh, covering the bands that we wanted to cover. And you can see in the wideband plot here that there's a, a reasonable amount of guard bands. Now we also did large signal simulations. The one I want to show here um, is quite interesting. This is the real part of the impedance that's presented to the main amplifier. And on one of the previous slides, I was saying that we start off uh, in low power with a, a, a two R opt impedance, and that's what we're seeing here. But this device is about 64 times. This is input power along the x-axis, and we see that this is about 64 ohms. As the input power increases, the auxiliary amplifier is switching on, and that's load pulling the main device, and it's changing the impedance that's being seen by the main device. When we get to the full output power, the main is seeing a load of 32 ohms, which is our opt for this particular device. So you can see that in simulation, we can actually see the, the, load, uh, the load pull or the, the doherty modulation um, happening in simulation, which gives us a lot of confidence in our design. And we designed our MIC and we put it in a custom laminate package that was developed in conjunction with Filtronic. This is using Rogers 4350B material. And this is a, a nice package. Uh, tooling charges are much less than something like an air cavity package. And also the die sits um, pretty level with the bond pads on the package itself, which means you can minimize the bond wire inductances. So this was a nice um, package to put out a minute in. So we had the Mimic fabricated, we had a package, we designed a, an evaluation PCB to be able to measure it, and you can see here, this is the MMIC and it's fully integrated. We have minimal off-chip components, um, these are just low frequency decoupling capacitors where we wouldn't be able to implement those sorts of values of capacitors on an MMIC without making the die too large. And all the measurements I'm going to show you, we've de-embedded it to the package plate so we stripped off the, the loss of our, uh, our PCB evaluation board. So these are measured S parameters. And what I've done is I've shown the same amplifier here in two different modes. We've got our dirty mode in blue, which is our nominal mode of operation. But we also measure it in what we call a balanced mode of operation. This <coughs> isn't the same thing as a true balanced amplifier um, where in a true balanced amplifier, you'd have a um, hybrid coupler at the output, a quadruple hybrid coupler. But what we do in the balanced mode is we turn the bias of the auxiliary amplifier up. And what that allows us to do is to look at the efficiency and provide a benchmark to see how much better we're doing with the dirty mode of operation. And we measured the F parameters, and it shows that as you'd expect, because the auxiliary amplifier is on, as well, it's getting 3 dB better than the dirty configuration. So this is what we'd expect, but we'll see in a minute that the back off efficiency of the dirty mode is much better. We plotted the measured versus simulated S parameters, and we get a nice fit between simulation and measurement. Simula simulated S parameters in red, 
and measured in blue. You can see that in our simulations, we're clearly capturing the two um, parts of the input return loss, the two poles, and we see a slight shift down in frequency between measured and simulated, um, but it's very small. The gain is slightly lower in measurement compared to simulation. It's about 18 dB compared to 19 dB, and there's a small amount of, of roll off just below the band. But when we look at the wide band parameters, we can see we're getting really a very good fit between measured and simulated. So we then measured the Doherty amplifier uh, in high power mode. Uh, this is using a pulsed 100 microsecond 10% due to cycle signal. And we measured it in balance mode, which as I described is with the auxiliary amplifier switched on. And this sort of follows it a classic um, class B, class A, B efficiency curve. But the Doherty mode is doing significantly better. So at the peak output power of uh, 45 dBm, they're getting similar efficiencies. But if we look at sort of 37 dBm back off point, our balance amplifier is giving about 20% PAE, whereas our Doherty is giving 31.5% PAE, so doing significantly better. We measured it across frequency as well, uh, 3.4 to 3.8 gigahertz, get with the same signal, this is just in Doherty mode this time, and we can see that we get nice repeatability across frequencies, but a nice flat uh, design, and across all the frequencies we're getting uh, about 30, 32% uh, back off efficiency. We also put some modulated signals uh, through this amplifier. Now, Roden Schwartz kindly lent us some kit to do these measurements. We used an SMB uh, 100B to generate our 5G new radio signal. Uh, we used an FSW to, uh, to measure the linearity of the amplifier, and a USB power sensor to measure the, the input power going into the device. Now, we had to put a driver amplifier and a test setup to uh, be able to drive the amplifier hard enough, and our linearity measurements actually include the effect of this driver amplifier. We, we don't think it's having a huge effect on the linearity, but the, the base uh, performance of the, um, of the Doherty amplifier is going to be slightly better than, than the results of the tree. And this is an example screenshot that we can get from the FSW. Uh, this is an ACLR measurement. And we can see that here we're using a 100 megahertz um, representative 5G signal, and we're measuring across a bandwidth of uh, 500 megahertz. So we can measure the ACLR um, across the band. And when we do a drain efficiency versus output power measurement for this type of signal, again, we can see the efficiency improvement of the Doherty mode of operation. This is now average output power to the signal on the x-axis, and if we take 37 dBm, again you can see whilst the balance mode is giving about 20%, the dirty mode is giving closer to 30. And, and this was using a challenging signal, um, the peak to average ratio was about 11.5 dB, so it's quite a challenging um, signal to test around. Again we measured it across frequency, and found that we had good flatness uh, across the, uh, the operating band and getting about 30% efficiency at back off with, uh, with these signals. We also measured the ACLR and I've got those results here. It's worth noting we didn't apply any DPD um, to our signal so we would be able to improve the linearity performance through the use of DPD, but this shows that the amplifier is, is linearizable. And we also measured the EBM. We can see at the uh, average um, power levels of about 20 to 30, it's about 2.5%. At the 36 DBM point, so 4 watts of average output power, we're getting about 3.5%. Again, no DPD applied to this measurement. So summary of the performance, we designed an amplifier that works over 3.4 to 3.8 gigahertz, 18 dBs 
in the dirt's mode of operation, good input and output return losses, saturated output power of 45 dBm with a peak power added efficiency of 50%. At 8 dB back off, we get a PAE of 31.5%. And using a representative 5G new radio signal with a 100 megahertz bandwidth, we got an EBM of 3.5% and an ACLR of 33 dBc. So if you want to find out more about this design, we've got a page on our website, plexfrfi.com. We are also are going to have an RF Global Net article on this design coming out soon. Um, feel free to send an email or to speak to me and Liam uh, during the lunch break. Thanks for your time.